All right, we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Simply Tech Live. This is your first time tuning in. Simply Tech Live is a collection of discussions with technologists and business leaders all about the evolving landscape of technology. And we have an amazing episode tuned up today. We're going to be talking about this thing called open innovation. Ali, tell us about today's discussion. Well, so here's the thing. Like, first of all, I can't believe that one month has passed since you know uh, the last time we start planning about having the session. But like you said, I'm super excited. I've had a great pleasure to work with both Jason and Lisa, and they're going to introduce themselves, uh, working on ser very interesting projects uh, in the West. But uh, also, we have a couple of other important topics that perhaps you want to talk about it before we jump into the, the main topic for today. You want to talk about? Yeah. And when we think about open innovation, and we're going we're gonna to get deep into what this means, we're going to be talking about the innovation process that Microsoft is using with a lot of our, our biggest customers or strategic partners. And we're also going to talk about all the different components that allow these innovative ideas and solutions to be born. And some of those things align with uh, unlocking bias and bringing in diverse perspectives. And just to give a little bit of space, some things that are going on in the DNI community, the DNI era that we're in right now. It is a uh, uh, Pride Month, so Happy Pride Month. It's the month of June, I believe. Uh, it was officially commem commemorated by Bill Clinton in uh, June 11th, 1999, around some of the events with the Stonewall riots. So if you haven't done any reading or research, it's a good time to just get a little closer to the LGBTQ community. And then also, I think I was just checking my my alerts this morning looks like Joe Biden officially signed a bill not too long ago that is commemorating uh, Freedom Day or June mm -hmm. 19th when uh, the last uh, slaves, uh, African-American slaves, were actually um, uh, uh, freed. So a lot of things are going on. And I think it's going to be uh, very important to some of the topics we're talking about today, Ali. And also, you know, some great news on vaccination rate and, you know, where the California is going. I'm kind of a little bit biased, but uh, June 15, we reopened California and we're hoping to see the same thing for all the other states. So it's good to be back and interact with people. And hopefully our next session is going to be in person. I, I, I hope so. I hope so. It'll be fun. Okay. So let's let's get these guests and this is going to be a fun discussion. Get ready for this. So we have Jason Deskin, he's the CTO for our digital advisory services team, supporting the West region at Microsoft, as well as the US retail and CPG organization. And we also have Lisa Griego from San Diego. She's director in the retail and consumer goods industry on the West Coast. Um, let's go ahead and welcome these amazing guests to the show. Hello. Hi. Hey, Derek. Hello. Ali. How are y'all doing this morning? Fabulous. Doing great. Fantastic. So let's get started. Jason, can you introduce yourself? Tell us what you're doing here today at Microsoft. What are you, what are you up to? Who are you? Yeah. So I, uh, like you mentioned, I am uh, the uh Oh, we got, we got a little bit of an audio issue, Jason. Can't hear you. You cannot hear me. Hold on one second. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now, go for it. Okay, excellent. So like you mentioned, I'm the CTO for uh, retail and consumer goods across the US for our digital advisory services business. I also uh, have a team focusing on the West region as well. Um, and what that really means is we in digital advisory, it's a team of consultants, business program managers, solution architects, managing directors that uh, work with our customers to uh, unpack and figure out ways to actually create new value for them and also capture more value. So it's a, it's a great organization to work for. We've got some great leaders and uh, pretty excited to have the opportunity to work with, with this team. Awesome. Lisa, how about yourself? Can you, uh, I already told the group that you were from San Diego, so you got to yeah. drop some knowledge on us about <laughs> what's going on with you and in our organization. Yeah, so um, I've been with Microsoft now for about three years, and what I do is essentially help bridge that gap between what our tech can do and um, help simplify it for the line of business that I work with across the different retailers and consumer goods companies, specifically on the West Coast. 
Um, I've been with Microsoft um, for three years. I Prior to that, I spent 16 years at P&G. Um, so I've sold everything from Tide, Charm and Bounty to Crest, Oral-B and Olay skincare. Um, and I've had a lot of different experiences in terms of helping um, P&G think a little bit differently in terms of what winning online looks like um, back in the day when I was working on Amazon and um, translate that knowledge in the past to a lot of the different conversations that I'm having with the retailers and consumer goods companies that I support today. Perfect. So um, let's start with talking about the main topic of the day. So Jason, uh, as you can see, I'm wearing my MSUS CTO hat. Uh, we're also part of the CDO group. So uh, maybe we can first start uh, for you to just share with the audience, what do we do you know, as part of the CDO org and as part of the MSUS CTO? Uh, we had Gina in a couple of other sessions. So we talk in depth about like, you know, our mission, but maybe you can add or shed more light on it. And uh, the second part of the question is really about talking about what is this thing called open innovation and, you know, how is adding value to what customers want to do and, you know, helping them with their journey in digital transformation and what is the role of the CDO, CTO work to help the customers in that journey? All right. Well, that's, uh, so I'll start with the question about the CDO and the CTO org. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's actually a really amazing organization within Microsoft US. The CDO uh, org is led by Jackie Wright. Uh, and it's really about how do we enable our business here in the US? Um, we've got different capabilities like the capabilities that we have in the CTO org, which I'll talk about here in a moment. We have business outcome capabilities. Uh, we have uh, teams that support and enable uh, our field teams to, um, you know, to work a little bit closer with their customers and to connect better and to understand them better. So in general, it's a, it's an organization that's really about enabling our business and our customers here in the U.S. The CTO org specifically is led by uh, Gina Lofton, who you mentioned before, and she's our, our CTO for the U.S. And Gina has our MTCs, which you know obviously all of you're, you're part of, and they also she also has digital advisory services, our solution architects as well. Um, and this is really an organization that is a field consulting organization with a mission to go out and help our customers truly transform. And when we talk about transformation, we're talking about real business transformation. How do we help our customers feel new uh, revenue streams through digital products and services? How do we help them become a software run business or operate their business through software so they can capture more of that value? Um, so it's, a, it's really a, a very high end, high caliber team of folks that go out and work with our customers to think differently about how they can create and capture value. Perfect. Uh, now let's talk about uh, this offering, the Open Innovation. Okay. What can you tell us? Yeah, I mean, so Open Innovation is this concept of working with organizations and individuals outside of your own. Like historically, you would see organizations would, um, you know, they'd, they'd source R&D internally. Everything was very secretive. And the challenge with that is that, you know, we all kind of carry a certain types of bias with us, right? We see the world through the lens of our own experiences. And oftentimes, you know, we miss a lot of what else is happening out there, not only because we may not have exposure to other industries and different things like emerging technology as one example, but our own experiences as human beings, right? And, and sometimes we find that uh, some folks might surround themselves with similar type people, and so open innovation really allows you to bring in different people with different backgrounds, with different perspectives, and um, they have a different type of expertise that may allow you to kind of put aside any bias that you have and work through that. And so open innovation is about um, how you partner with entities and individuals so that you can rapidly accelerate your innovation cycles by leveraging that different perspective that comes from having people who have different experiences. And Jason, and like when you think about innovation, you know, a lot of our partners and you see these large organizations, they have entire innovation portfolios. They have teams that are working on innovation and they're, they're you know, trying to spin off new ventures and invest in new products and do things differently, move up the, the you know, become more vertically integrated, whatever that looks like. They're trying to increase their channel, all these things, but you never really hear things like bias. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the inhibitors of innovation as we have come to realize them 
And then what is Microsoft's approach to kind of tackling some of these inhibitors? Yeah, well, one thing I wanna just quickly address before we go there is that, you know, when we talk about innovation and that term means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but generally what we're talking about is innovating on new products, innovating on new services, innovating on how you operate your business and even innovating on your business model, how you create value. Um, and so in terms of those inhibitors, there's a very interesting, um, there's a very interesting unconscious bias test. It's called the surgeon's dilemma. And we'll put a link here in the chat. But basically I encourage everyone to go out there, take this, take this test. It's, a, it's actually kind of a riddle. And then ask yourself, you know, how, how you felt about your, your, uh, your answer to that riddle. Um, but what I have found is generally when we do this test with large groups, about 70% of people will actually get it wrong. And it's not that um, these are people that just carry a lot of bias with them. It's just that, you know, unconscious bias is real. And sometimes we don't even realize that, that we have it. Um, so with that said, you know, when we're working with, with our customers, um, we'll generally run into different types of bias. One type of bias might be that we've always done it this way. And so there's this mindset to think that um, that's the only way to do it. There's also, um, you know, this sort of this confirmation bias where you, you tend to surround yourself with people who think like you and, and sort of confirm what you, what you want them to confirm. And that's also very dangerous as well, because, you know, what you want are people who are thinking differently and challenging your thinking. Um, and that's why it's important to also have folks from outside your organization. And also, you know, one thing that, you know, I'll generally, you know, when I'm having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you know, one thing that's very interesting is that there are no experts in the future of retail. There's only experts in, in how retail used to be, right? So there's only this historical expertise. So if you really want to think about what retail or consumer goods or manufacturing or any other industry might look like in the future, well, that's all being thought up right now, um, you know, Technology is evolving very rapidly. The impact of that technology is, is being seen in a new way every single day. And, um, you know, I, you need folks around you that, that can think differently about how that might change the game. Um, so there's tons of uh, case studies out there that talk about different types of disruption. Um, so we don't necessarily need to go into that here, but, um, you know, bias is a, is a real thing. And, um, you know, it's, it's super important to get folks in that think differently and will allow you to just navigate through that bias. Um, and so that's why tools like design thinking, open innovation, you know, uh, business model innovation and bringing diversity into the mix is extremely important. Yeah, and I would add on to that um, based on the number of open innovation labs that I've been a part of so far. One thing was constant that the only thing we know today is what we know today is wrong, right? Um, to Jason's point, technology is evolving at such a fast pace right now that those companies that are able to leverage all of the ubiquitous data that's out there today to capture those key consumer insights to deliver a differentiated experience will truly change the world. And we don't even know what the future of the world looks like, but how can we leverage what we know today to help not only shape, but influence as the technology continues to evolve at that same pace as well? But that's one of those recurring statements, like don't get into solution. The only thing we know today is what we know today is wrong. And that's kind of like sets up and level sets and gets us all grounded as we're in those um, open innovation labs together. So, so Lisa, I, mean, Lisa a... I, I, I love your background. <laughs> it goes with the theme of retail, so nicely done. Thanks. I got, I got my cons on right now, guys. Right there, got them on. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Derek. Uh, yeah, that, that's great. I it, just kind of wanting to tee you up for this topic specifically. So, you know, Jason really talked a lot about you know, open innovation and not just as a Microsoft construct, as a technology construct, but how an organization should be looking at innovation. And I, I think we have a lot to, to teach other orgs. But for you, you know, being a director in the retail and consumer goods, industry, you know, you're working with some of the biggest consumer goods retailers, uh, a lot of brands, uh, a, lot, a lot of folks really like and believe in, and they have a certain way of approaching problems and they expect a technology company, a vendor, a Microsoft, you know, to come to them to s solve problems in a specific way. What have you observed and that you think needs to be fixed and how do you think you've seen that approach 
um, just work a lot better through innovation? That That's a great question. Thanks for asking that. Um, I think when people in the ivory tower go with the approach that what the knowledge that they have is going to drive that that change or influence across the organization, that's not necessarily the right approach, right? If we can go through and create an environment in which there is an ability to take a bottoms up as well as a top down approach to changing what a potential go to market strategy could look like for a company, that is super critical. And that's kind of like how we structure these open innovation labs with Jason and this um, digital advisor group. All of what we're trying to do needs to be tied to their the customer's key strategic priorities, right? And to get a complete holistic view, you need to have different conversations across the entire organization. I've been involved in some open innovation labs that have been performed literally in the peak of COVID-19 when the world as we know it was shutting down, right? Even though that was taking place, it took the commitment of the customer to say, hey, we don't know what the future is going to hold yet, but we absolutely believe in this process and we want to ensure that we're getting the right folks involved to deliver that, right? So at that specific one engagement, we had over 20, per, 20 participants across the board, both from the customer side as well as the Microsoft side. We didn't just talk to the tech folks. We talked to the folks who are running data and AI, the people who are running store operations, the people who are running marketing. We conducted countless interviews across the board from people who were on the front line, as well as um, conducted nine virtual interactive workshops too, because again, this was all done online. And we kept on going with the mindset, like let's not get into the solution and let's figure out what the art of the possible could look like, right? And after that engagement, Microsoft was established as the trusted advisor for this customer, right? We shifted from a tactical partner to a strategic partner in order to help ideate and identify how do we co-innovate co in the future to deliver the needs of the larger business. What we were talking about in that OIL is stuff that hadn't really been discussed before and changing the current construct of how this specific retailer was going to market today, right? And when you only get to that future are the possible, if you have diversity of thoughts and experiences across the entire organization, to truly show up differently, and it was it was actually um, a remarkable um, a remarkable lab to be a part of. And when you get a customer to say, "Wow, I can't believe Microsoft was literally talking the same language that we are," and they they were acting like they've been in the industry for ten to fifteen years, that's a huge testament to show how deeply embedded we were in terms of being committed. Like, because we're only as successful as our customers are successful, and it was a it was a pretty sweet. Um, project be a part of, for sure. Great, great points. Uh, we have uh, lots of folks on the audience side, and Richard just said the ivory tower point is so important, and you know, definitely we agree. Uh, so, Jason, um, especially last year with everything that happened with COVID, I know at the MTC it was a, 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 a huge challenge and opportunity for April and the rest of the US team to kind of adapt to this new normal, right? Uh, because for us, MTC was about place, process, and people, and we lost the place. So we <laughs> successfully managed to kind of switch to this virtual uh, method of delivery and be able to bring the same impact or even like, you know, uh, comparing to the, the years prior, having even more engagements with the customers. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it's the same thing with your team because we work very closely to each other. Uh, can you explain, you know, uh, what do we do as part of this innovation, open innovation lab, especially, you know, uh, now that, you know, we do most of the things virtually. So we used to go to a place with a customer, kind of ideate and work together. And hopefully we're going to get back to that normal again now that, you know, things are getting better. But uh, just take us through this journey, you know, from beginning to end and how your team and uh, the CDO as a whole is going to assist and you know partner with the uh, the customer as part of this digital transformation journey. Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. So, it's uh, you know fir first thing is this is not uh, a typical um, sort of customer engagement. It, it really starts differently in terms of um, how we start the conversation with the customer. And so, what what I mean by that is. 
um, there's these sort of traditional models where you feel like you have to show up as the expert. And even though at Microsoft, we have tons of experts in different areas and different things, we have our own retail business as an example. We have obviously we run our own supply chain. Um, we have our own finance team, right? Um, you know, we, uh, we, we tend to want to show up as experts. And I think over time, we've sort of like, you know, kind of trained or, or you know, had our customers expect us to come with the, the answer or the solution to, the, to their problem proactively. And I think that that's still a, a valid approach because there's many known needs out there and there's many known solutions. And I think it's okay to show up with, hey, here's how we're handling that need. But with Open Innovation Lab, it's, a, it's quite a bit different. We don't show up saying we have a specific idea what your problem is and we already have the solution for you. What we generally do is we start with how do we set up this partnership? Um, Satya believes that every company will become a software platform company. And what that means is that either they will be software run, so their, 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 their companies will be operated through software, so that's better value capture, or that they'll create new digital products and services. And so what we typically see there is that, um, you know, new products and services can be in the form of something that complements existing products. So maybe today you sell a, an industrial robot, tomorrow you sell an industrial robot complemented by a platform that does predictive, uh, predictive maintenance, analytics, and insights on that robot. And so you, you do a subscription along with the physical sell of that robot. Uh, or they may stand up a new line of business and maybe it's just a new platform that goes along with physical goods. Uh, and then the final thing is, you know, something that's completely disrupt, you know, that completely disrupts their business. And that's the most challenging thing because oftentimes organizations have a hard time navigating, bringing in new disruptive products that are disrupting themselves. So how do you go through that journey? So anyway, um, the important part of that is why, why Microsoft? What role does Microsoft have to play in those types of discussions? And if you do believe that most organizations will be software run or will be creating new value through digital products and services, then who better than a company like Microsoft? So we're not trying to come in and sell you products and services. We're trying to come in and basically show you what is what are our assets that we have. We've gone through this transformational journey. We have, um, you know, we have hyperscale capabilities. We have different perspective. We're investing billions a year on new technology that's going to change the way that we live and work. And if you see that as valuable and if you see that as something that can help you kind of turn the corner and start working towards creating new digital products and services or becoming a software run business, then who better to partner with than a company like Microsoft? So it usually starts there. And if if our, you know, if our, our customer, which then becomes our partner, sees the value of that experience, that perspective, that investment that we're making, um, then we go. And when we go, we mean we are basically taking our customer through a design thinking motion, which doesn't start with us coming and telling them what their problems are and what their solutions are. It's really a joint journey together where we go out and we observe, we ask questions, we, we become very curious, we don't show up as experts. Um, and you know, we call it empathy work and need finding. And the whole idea is to go out there and uncover unexpected insights, things that we didn't even realize existed. And once we have that and we've done that jointly with our customer, that then sets the table for joint ideation. And joint ideation requires different people with different perspective from within our company, within our customer's company, and even outside of both of our organizations. And that's really that sets the foundation for that open innovation. Um, so bringing different people with different experiences, even from different industries, allows us to think differently about how we might actually approach the problem that we jointly uncover together. And then finally, you know, we're working very closely with your team, Ali, and the rest of the, the MTC organization to very rapidly start to test these ideas. You don't have to basically come up and say, this is the new solution. We can come up with a very small test called MVPs to rapidly answer some questions that we have so that we can move forward and feel comfortable that this is actually something that's going to be the right thing. So it's about shaping what that thing is incrementally, and it's about answering a set of questions. So design thinking is key. Business model innovation, creative work is key, digital enablement, and also ecosystem development. How do we connect our customers to create value as an ecosystem? So that's in a nutshell what the Open Innovation Lab is. Generally, it's an eight-week process. It's more about six weeks, but it's eight weeks to set up and get the right people engaged. And, um, and it, it doesn't end there. That's really where the partnership starts and where the great insights begin. Interesting enough, you know, uh I work with your team in two completely different 
customers, one in the media and entertainment, the other one in retail. And uh, it was just very eye-opening to work with the talented digital architects and solution architects working and, you know, partnering with MTC side and how, you know, it was really focusing on business value. Uh, I joined Microsoft 15 years ago, as part of Microsoft services, but the services work that I see today compared to, you know, when I joined is a day and night difference. So again, bringing that empathy, you know, proximity to the customer need and understanding their challenges and, you know, working together as part of that ideation, uh, I think is going to be key moving forward. So yeah, well, any 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 challenges uh, due to the COVID, you know, not being able to be in person with customer uh, and, you know, how did you guys overcome that challenge and how do you see this moving uh, or shifting to like, you know, more interaction or do you see something that is going to be more positive or, you know, it's not going to matter now that we're thinking about the hybrid workplace? Yeah, it, this has been huge. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to mention is when we do this, we're, we're working with lots of different people from, from throughout Microsoft, like with Lisa and her team. She's been so critical to these exercises. And, you know, my thing is, uh, and I had to actually kind of adjust my own biases. So coming into the situation with this particular customer that, that Lisa mentioned, we had always done this in person, you know, building those relationships, going out, hitting the pavement, doing research. Um, it was very strange at first to say, you know, we're going to do this virtually because I didn't feel like you could do design thinking justice by doing it virtually. But we learned that actually you can still have a, a very meaningful exercise virtually. So what I would say is I don't think there's a substitute from getting out there, doing this stuff in person, working as one team. What I love about these open innovation labs and the design thinking aspect of it is when you're going through it and you're working with your customer, there is no customer or Microsoft. It's just one team. We usually break folks out into multiple teams and it's just team red, team blue, team green. It's not different companies. Um, we still saw that in the virtual way that we delivered this. Um, so what we found is we can actually do this work virtually. Is it as good as doing it in person? No, um, but we can do it virtually. It made us rethink how we actually uh, run these exercises and actually, more importantly, when we actually, you know, when when things start to clear up and we go out and we start traveling again, there's so much that we can do virtually. So we will have more of a hybrid approach. We can leverage a lot of the tools that we we're forced to use, like, uh, you know, Klaxoon and Mural and those types of tools. Um, so it will definitely create a much better experience with the kind of the, the mixture of that virtual and physical type exercise. Yeah, and I would uh, say like during that time, it was the flexibility because when you're going through and doing and you're in it and you're spending four to six hours just ideating and thinking outside of the box, it's exhausting. Like it's really hard to do. It's really hard to stay completely engaged. It's really hard not to check your email or get a text from your phone or whatever. You have to be completely in it. And so from that perspective, there's very few times when you're able to have that type of up close and personal develop banter with your customers that I really think that it did elevate our relationship and took it to the next level because you develop that trust. You develop that trust with the banter and like developing those close relationships because you legitimately were in the trenches. And the cool thing is you, if we were, if we all hit a wall and the energy levels were down. It's like, great, let's go through and look for a different time to schedule it within the following week or the next day or later on in the afternoon and whatnot. And it really drove, um, I would say, a high energy, impactful session with the Open Innovation Lab that, uh, that I was a part of. And I've been in other scenarios too, where it's just like the energy level wasn't right there. It could have been a number of different things or not having the right, um, broad, diverse thought, if we just go through and focus in one wheelhouse of a, co a company, it's not as effective. Like, I can't reiterate the importance of expanding the scope, getting outside of the world of tech, getting other diverse thoughts from a marketing perspective, ops, like whatever the case may be, it's so critical in order to get that diversity in thought, for sure. Great point. So uh, <laughs> interestingly enough, I remember, uh, you know, we've been having this conversation in terms of importance of knowledge about industries. Uh, but in the past, I remember that we were working in silence, right? And, you know, for us, it was about like, a, you know, why should I know about this in industry or that industry? But 
now that we're all working together, you know, understanding the language of the customer and be able to, you know, articulate that is going to be super important. And uh, I specifically, you know, saw you in action, right? But something that was even more interesting for me was that uh, when we work in with, let's say, a retail customer and talking about this innovation lab and, you know, ideas and, you know, how to ideate certain things that uh, it becomes really the art of the possible, we can use that learning and even adapt that to a different industry or a different customer. And that actually oh, yeah. happened with the, the, the M&E customers that we're working on and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So it, it is just huge. I think the value that we can bring to the table. Uh, but uh, Lisa, you know, in your past three years at Microsoft, uh, how do you see this like power of cross collaboration between, you know, different teams and different orgs? I mean, especially coming from uh, outside of Microsoft. Uh, how do you see that today? Well, I could, based on how I, because I c consider myself growing up within the PNG world, right? Um, and in order to get a product from inception and carry it to market, it requires that level of collaboration, right? Collaboration with your supply chain, your marketing um, operations, every single person, your your customers, in order to ensure that it's going to market flawlessly. Um, and the same holds true within this specific space. It's not going to be one group that delivers the end result to the consumer of, with the retailers and the consumer goods companies that we're working with. But what I see is how fast we're able to iterate, like a solution that we were able to sell in at one specific customer for one use case can quickly be evolved into another customer with a different use case. And it's, 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 eye-opening and baffling to me in terms of how quick we're able to evolve um, and take those learnings and then quickly reapply them. Um, one thing that we talk about here a lot at Microsoft is operating with that growth mindset, right? What's what's the next thing? How can we sit there and take what we know to be true and then scale it across the board? And there's so many amazing conversations that I know I've been a part of that my peers have been a part of across the entire US and as well as the globe. And we are so close knit that I can easily take um, something that's been working elsewhere and then reapply it within my specific industry. It doesn't matter if I'm talking to a grocer or a pure play or a um, consumer goods company. There's a lot of interchangeable, a lot of interchangeable technologies and capabilities that we have at our disposal. Perfect. Uh, there's a, a question from the audience, and that's uh, what types of advantages did you lose by completing the labs virtually versus in person? Uh, I think, uh, Jason, you kind of alluded to that a little bit, but I don't know if you want to add more. Yeah, so um, the advantages that we lost, it's interesting because when you're in person, we uh, you can really um, kind of track how, uh, how the team is doing. Are they tired? Um, you know, are we productive? Is it P are people engaged? So in person, we'll generally say, put your laptops, you know, close your laptops. We'll open them up when we need them, but generally we don't need them during the, the open innovation labs. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, you're all working together in the same room. So there isn't this, you know, when you're virtual, your, your laptop's open and things are, you know, lighting up and, and coming into your face constantly. And um, so you kind of lose that. You know, we'll stop if we feel like the energy is draining. We'll do some things to build some energy, get some snacks, have some coffee, go for a walk, whatever it might be. And so virtually, it's really tough to keep the energy up, and especially when you're on a computer all day long. So we found that we had to, you know, where we would go through very grueling three days, eight hours a day uh, in person. Um with the virtual thing, we can't do more than two hours at a time. So we'll generally do two hours in the morning and two hours at night, which means we're spreading it out longer as well. So you're losing that advantage of being able to get in there and just, you know, really be productive over a short period of time. That's at least for the workshop, the, the research is different. Um, so you do lose that advantage. So managing energy, managing engagement, um, and uh, the amount of time that it, it now takes because you can't be on your computer that long without really getting burnt out, so. Interesting. Yeah, and I would uh, say it, the thing to build on that real quick is the moderator and being, the moderator used at the Open Innovation Lab and being able to pick up on the cues of the, the audience and the people who are in the, the lab um, is super critical, you know, because sometimes you can't force a, like you can't force it. You can't force the creativity. You can't force the out of the box thinking so it requires somebody who's super stealth to like read the body cues to say, okay, guys, let's take a 20 minute break. 
go do whatever you need to do and then cut, let's get back at it or reschedule or whatnot, um, which I think is critical. But that that is very indicative of what you'd also reapply within the um, physical if you're face to face too. I've Interesting been, enough, been off. go ahead. Uh, I, I was gonna just on this conversation, I've been lucky to be a part of uh, Jason's team, which you Ali really helped spearhead the the move from the, the sales organization into Jason's team to work in the, Thank in the you, Ali. organization. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of great advice. And I hosted the final workshop the, which we call the vision demonstrator, where we share our shared vision, this beautiful creative story around the innovation um, yesterday. And I realized that you, you have like, it's so hard to keep people engaged virtually. And there's so many tactics that you have to learn from people that have been doing this for a long time. So we have folks on our team, a gentleman named Simon, he's been doing innovation for a really long time. He, you know, he told me to pull out on my, my kids toys and use the toy and it was a tickle me elmo the one i chose and it tickled the elmo when certain things would come up in the conversation to get people on their feet and to ask everyone to put their video on and to you know really bring a lot of energy play music in between breaks so like there's all these cool maneuvers that you can pull into the engagement because at the end of the day people just aren't going to pay attention and how do you innovate if we're all in our offices you know, or in our living rooms and the kids and the vacuums and all those things are going. So uh, just real world experience there. Go ahead, Ali, you were, you were gonna mention something. Yeah, the, the other thing is we kind of saw the same pattern at our MTC sessions. And uh, one thing that I'm grateful is really having access to text like Teams and you know all the innovation that is happening within the Teams product that helps us do this, you know, virtually uh, is not gonna be always as the same as in person. So that's why we're looking forward to getting back. But one of the benefits was that we always had customers that they were really hesitant to drive or commute to one of our centers, right? And with this virtual delivery, it opened up and widened the reach. So they were more open to engage with, you know, uh, Microsoft, whether it's going to be a open innovation lab or, you know, a design session or design thing. So, uh, I think the hybrid is gonna uh, give us both advantages for us to you know, have closer reach to the customers and you know, be able to work with them together. Uh, there is a question uh, from uh, uh, our audience here and, and great insights from Lisa and Jason. Uh, his question is, what does Microsoft expect from a partner in these transformation deals and also open innovation lab? Yeah, that's a great question. So partners are extremely critical um, not only are we a partner to, to our customer, but our customer, um, you know, is a partner to us, but again, kind of going back to open innovation, it's about bringing in different people and different organizations with different perspectives. So just trying to do this with just, you know, Microsoft and just our customer, that would be a miss. We, we oftentimes want to get multiple customers together. We want to get different partners who have different capabilities and different perspectives around what's possible. We start at a business level, right? So it's really about how do we achieve this outcome or how do we create a new line of business? How do we create new value through a new digital product? And then we work our way as we go through and we try to figure out like, how do we enable that through technology? And we have so many amazing partners uh, that we've had along the journey that are, are extremely critical. So uh, I guess the short answer is partners are absolutely key. Uh, the more folks that we can get plugged in, whether they be academic institutions, technology partners, other types of partners um, is uh, is absolutely essential, I think, to having a, a successful open innovation lab. Yeah, okay. and I'd say, like to piggyback on that, going in without an end solution in mind, like we have, we could back up our truck. We have endless and countless capabilities from a technology perspective. But I think what our part of our secret sauce is our ability to go through and identify exceptional partners. I mean, I can't, I can think of my, the laundry list of the amount of partners that I've engaged with on a daily basis are truly remarkable. And they, they are on the bleeding edge of like the, the latest and the next best thing. Um, so even though we may have a, a lot of first party solutions, we still will go through and help navigate the third party ecosystem as well, which is another reason why we should be leveraged as their strategic partner, right? Why would why would a retailer spend countless hours and days and weeks trying to curate or identify a partner to solve a solution 
one of the first calls should be us because we have already mined it. We've already know, we can tell you, this is tried and true. These partners are successful. These partners have failed or whatever the case may be. And it truly develops and creates that cohesive collaborative relationship between um, it's not an us versus them. Like we are literally in the boat rowing with them to their key business outcome that they're trying to achieve. I want to tag on to that just with one, one, just one quick statement. Um, I mean, two, two very important things. One is we don't know what we don't know. Um, and so starting with that empathy work and being curious and asking a lot of questions, we uncover so many really amazing new things that we hadn't even thought about. So that's one side of the coin is, is coming in being curious versus coming in as the expert. The second side though, is uh, again, you don't know what you don't know. And so sometimes you don't even know what's possible. Right. So our customers are bringing perspective and we're not even thinking about it. We're bringing some perspective on what might be possible that wasn't possible yesterday or five months ago or, you know, or a year ago. And so that's actually essential. And then bringing in our partners, sometimes our partners are doing some things that we're not even thinking about. So they're bringing a new perspective into the exercise. And, and it kind of goes back to you don't know what you don't know. Right. Um, and, and that's why that partner uh, you know, that partner involvement is so key. And that's why coming in curious is, is extremely essential. A quick question. Uh, let's say uh, I'm watching this program and I'm really interested to engage with Microsoft. Uh, what would be the process? I mean, uh, who should I reach out to? Uh, how could we get connected to, you know, Lisa and Jason and NTCs and Derek? Yeah, it's a great question. So there's so many different uh, avenues to get connected. Um, so one is uh, you could start through our uh, consulting portal on Microsoft.com. Um, you could come, you know, come come to us on LinkedIn, uh, introduce yourself, and and we'd love to work with you. Um, you could come through your um, what's called a CCM, which is a person working with our customers. Um, and uh, they're, they're, they're generally aligned to a lot of the folks that we work with. But if you don't have a CCM or you don't have somebody managing your relationship with Microsoft, um, you, can, you can come straight to us or you can go through our consulting portal, uh, which we can provide a link to uh, here shortly. Yeah, and I would say CSAM for those who don't know is Customer Success Account Manager. Just there you go. Jason. Thank you. Um, Microsoft and acronyms. We have to translate the acronyms. Um, <laughs> but, but no, I think like it's it's important to, to go through and if you don't have a Microsoft rep, identify who your Microsoft rep is. But honestly, you could reach out to either Jason um, or myself just to get the to wet the beak a little bit. We could go through and set up follow up meetings. It, it's literally not a problem. It'll take. So, just, so Jason, one question. Uh, when we talk about like interacting with customers, do we really care about like the the size of the customer? Is it always enterprise? So if we have like a smaller uh, player that they have some great ideas and they want to collaborate, can they still you know partner with Microsoft? Uh, how do you see this like uh, equation? Yeah, that that's a that's a very good question. So we um, you know we just love working with organizations that. Um, one are actually trying to transform their their business um, that uh, see the value in working with a company like Microsoft and want to have the right conversation. When we talk about the right conversation, there's so many people at Microsoft that that you can talk to about our products and our different solutions. In terms of engagement with my team and the organization that I represent, um, it's really about: Do you want to have a conversation about your toughest business challenges, creating new value? Uh, do we have the right people, you know, at the table? Um, you know, do you see the value of partnering with with a company like Microsoft? And if we have an organization like that, we we love to work with those types of those types of folks. Um, so I don't really look at the size of the organization, although we are not a a very large team, and so we are working a lot with some of our biggest customers. But um, you know, we're open to working with anyone. Um, you know, if, if we've got a good a good alignment between the organizations. Quick question. We had someone from uh, uh, the team kind of respond. Manuel Pardavia, he's part of, a, he just joined Microsoft six months ago. He was, before he was a global IoT uh, a str a strategist. I met him at a, at a conference serendipitously a couple of years ago and he was asking me some questions. And then lo and behold, he joins the team and he, he pings me on, on Teams. And he's part of our chief digital officer organization. He's in the customer business outcomes group, uh, the CBO. 
And he's asking this question about innovation. When, you're, when we're talking about the art of the possible, we're talking about things that don't exist. How do you value? What are the valuation exercises? Like, how do you, how do you put business acumen and commercial acumen behind something that is not real yet today? Um, maybe yeah. that's a question for, for Ali, Jason, and Lisa, since you guys have all worked together on these, on these labs before. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with um, a couple of things there. So this is not your, your typical kind of, um, say, partnership and consulting in that if you're coming to us and you're looking for a specific solution that you're, that's known and it's going to solve a particular problem or you're looking for a specific product, that's pretty clear what you're getting and what you're asking for. And so, you know, the, the value of what you're getting is going to be pretty easy to, to articulate. When we're talking about true transformation, generally we don't start to really understand the story until we get to the end of this open innovation lab. And so a couple of things that we do there, so we don't just go out and dream. Um, what, what we do is we have a number of folks on the team that uh, do business value modeling. And so what we really want to do is we want to ensure that anything that we're talking about, anything that's going to uh, potentially be uh, adopted by the customer or implemented by the customer, uh, that there's some real value behind it. So we have folks that, that do that value modeling uh, on the team. The other thing is innovation is, you know, we're, we're sometimes talking about creating new products, but it's basically creating new capabilities based off of existing capabilities. And so, um, you know, sometimes we're completely starting from scratch, which is rare. Uh, oftentimes we're envisioning something that's possible that our customers hadn't thought about where we're bringing a, a, a series of different types of capabilities together to rapidly uh, move that journey forward. Because we don't want to spend years and years just dreaming about it. We really want to make it real. We want to make it happen now. Um, and so that's one of the other advantages that we have is that we have um, we have these capabilities. We can accelerate that journey. Um, and we have folks that will very rapidly help with that value modeling. And just, I think, kind of closing out the discussion, we have about 12 minutes left. One of the things uh, we wanted to talk about is, and I'll kind of shoot this to you, Lisa, to kind of kick off the discussion. But we, you know, we talked about bias. We talked about this diverse perspective. We talked about inter-organizational collaboration between the big, the big organizations we're partnering with, us, you have folks like uh, uh, Manuel from the, uh, the, a different organization at Microsoft that could potentially help us value some of these innovations. A lot of different parties, a lot of different groups. You know, what is the, what is the true power of diversity and in an inclusive workplace? You know, having women in, in, in the team, having uh, a black community represented, having folks from the international community represented, having LGBTQ leaders in these innovation, innovation exercises, kind of pushing these projects forward. Lisa, it'd be great for you to talk about like what that means for you. Like, why is it valuable? What's the competitive edge? Like, I really want to underline the power of having these diverse teams. Yeah, there is no doubt that having a diverse perspective and a diverse workforce drives shareholder value, period. I've seen it firsthand at p and I see it start to take shape here within Microsoft as well. But if I were to tell you that this, the number of startups established by women today deliver 2x the revenue for every dollar invested, a lot of you guys would be like, there's no way. There's no way that's possible. But in fact, it's true, right? And But if I were to tell you that the percentage of women who actually own startups right now is around 10%, that it doesn't make sense. Those two those two metrics don't make sense at all. And unfortunately, right now, women represent about 25% of all the jobs in the tech industry as it sits today. From a Microsoft perspective, we're we're inching, we're outpacing that exi existing metric, which is great. But I could tell you that when you have the diverse representation in terms of history, thought, past, et cetera, embedded within your org in, in a, organization it drives innovation like period at png was great because we at i still say we but at png they had the highest average rate of women who created a lot of the innovations that png delivered that's a huge that's a huge step right and from my perspective not only am i a woman but i'm also a proud latina i'm also portuguese and i grew up in a family of tuna fishermen right 
Um, college wasn't really a discussion when I grew up, right? And when you add on the additional layer of the massive adversity that I myself had to overcome when I came out to my parents at the age of 18 and all of those challenges that that faced, it's really a, an, an act of God and a miracle that I'm even here right now talking to you about that, right? But all of those past experiences, my experiences within P&G and everything, make me a better leader, make me a better um, advocate for those who are not necessarily represented, right? Like I should be on the majority of our meetings and get a 50-50 play in a lot of our meetings, but unfortunately that's not the nature of how it is today. But I know I, I'm taking a conscious effort to turn and pull. Like I would not be here without the tribe that I have and the powerful women behind me. I mean, I have my pictures right here, both from a personal and professional side. Like, and it takes one woman or one Latina or one Latin male or who, a black male, whatever, to make that first leap and then turn and pull the others along with us in order so we ensure that we're making the entire world better. And, and when you think about Microsoft's empower every person on the planet to achieve more, I mean, I take that to heart and we truly try and abide by that each and every day. And it's, it's really great to be a part of this company that does that. If we're going to create for the world, we have to be represented by the world. Yeah, for that's, sure. that's the bottom line. You know, Ali, I think, you know, you hire very tactical people. That's what, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of managing these two entities in Denver and Irvine, these technology centers, which are filled with these, you know, chief architects and solution architects that are building solutions or building prototypes for a lot of these innovation solutions that are coming out of this innovation organization that Jason is running. Like, what do you see? What, what do you strive for when it comes to skills, hardcore skills? Are you looking for diversity of skills? Are you looking for, like, how do you go about even trying to build up that acumen? Uh, diversity is key. BNI is core to our business. And we see the impact when you have a diversity as Jason mentioned, I mean, we're gonna be closer to the customer because that's where coming. everybody's coming from, right? So having that point of view, not being biased and you know, being inclusive is gonna help you. It's equally as important as your technical skills. So that's something that we continue to thrive of. And whenever we have an opening, we wanna make sure that we have that uh, lens and not be myopic, hiring people. Jason, any any thoughts? I, I know just from our conversations, you are extremely conscientious of building a team that represents the world. Any thoughts about you know how you do that or or, or things that you want to continue to try to work on moving forward? Yeah, definitely. So I, I think the first thing is you have to take a step back and think differently um, about. Um, how you want your, your team to be represented. You have to really be intentional uh, about going out and, and attracting amazing folks uh, into your team. Um, so, you know, I've seen a huge difference just in terms of, you know, the, the creativity of thought, the different, you know, the diversity of thought. Um, and as we continue to dig in and invest in, in building a, a team that's represented by the world, um, our team only becomes way more, you know, becomes much better. And, and you know, it's not easy because uh, you, you can't just sit back and wait for it to happen. You have to go out there, you have to network, you have to talk to folks and you have to go after, um, you know, the amazing folks that you want in your team. And, and you have to be very, very, very intentional. So I'd say it's not, uh, it's not something that's automatic. You have to be serious, you have to be intentional and you have to you know, continue to evangelize what it means when, when you do bring great diversity onto your team. Thanks for that, Jason. So the last comment that we had was from Sarah Andrade. She says, yes, Lisa, turn and pull the tribe behind you is a huge asset. So, thank you, Sarah, for the comment. Um, so that is all for us. We have five minutes um, that we can give back to folks. Just wanted to say, Jason, Lisa, thank you so much for sharing your insights, for talking about innovation, um, for having the conversation and even, you know, bubbling it into other areas that really matter for a lot of different folks based upon the way the world is changing and evolving. So I really appreciate you guys coming on the call. Thank you for having us. Bye -bye. This is fun. Thank you. All right, folks.
Thanks everyone for watching. Hopefully you can turn in, tune into the next one. I don't know when it's gonna be because me and Ali are probably gonna take a little bit of time off. <laughs> we need it. <laughs> so we will uh, see you all soon. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.